день добрый, Краков. Называемся Сергей Маринец, приехали из Украины. Hello everyone, I'm Sergey Marinets and I came from Ukraine to speak a sad story about Java 8 migration called Java 8 anti-patterns. So I assume there is at least hungry persons here, correct? Or maybe the most hungry for new knowledge. That's okay. So uh, a few words about myself. I am mostly Java backend developer. I am technical writer, so I wrote three books. I am Java trainer and coach. I like to participate in the conferences in Ukraine, in uh, Europe, and I'm very glad, very happy to uh, come to Krakow and uh, present here. So Java 8, what is Java 8? Java 8, uh, because of a lot of excellent features, uh, it's uh, what one of the most expected Java releases ever. Yeah, it was uh, mainly inspired by Scala, by uh, Google Guava, Yoda Time Libraries. It reintroduced functional programming in Java. And it, uh, my, my intention is to make our code more readable, more flexible, more efficient, and uh, safer. Uh, so let's make a quick poll. Who is using Java 6 in production here? OK, a few. Uh, Java 7. OK, Java 8. OK, Java 9. I'm the only one. OK, great. Uh, so I think uh, all of you know and use uh, Golf patterns, and I think most of you knows that in Java 8, uh, a lot of patterns like command, factory, method, uh, strategy are easier to implement, easier Java 8, like uh, method references, lambda expressions. However, since a lot of persons simultaneously migrate to Java 8, there are some uh, confusion and misusage and uh, that's why uh, anti-patterns uh, appeared, what we uh, talk now. And uh, the main reason to appear is first reason is API misusage, so using API in the wrong way. A second reason is that uh, people try to use it like a silver bullet. Yeah, so everywhere, everywhere we're using old structures, we started using Java 8 API. So optional, optional is, uh, New API Java 8. It was uh, mainly inspired on optional from Google Guava. In theory, it allows to avoid null pointer exception and make code uh, more readable and more safe. And let's imagine we have a Java developer that's new by in Java 8 and he wants to migrate his project, Java 7 project, in Java 8. And it's a very simple function, it's empty, and this developer heard about optional and let's use it and the second option of this uh, function, second implementation. So uh, let's compare the two implementation. Uh, what has changed? Uh, does new code look more readable, more concise, safer? No, because the first implementation was clear, simple, and straightforward. But what has changed? The only change is that every time we invoke is empty function, we call a new object optional. So now we have a memory overhead and put additional pressure on garbage collector. Yes. So anytime you use new API, try to think what is benefit of that. Yes. Another example, we have a user class uh, with simple fields, uh, getters and setters, and um, our developer again wants to bring a security to that and what he do on he replaces all the types is optional. So now he has optional fields, optional parameters, optional turn types. So what has changed now? So the first change is that if you use this class in serialization, it will not work now. Why? Because optional is not serialized. Secondly, inside of your uh, user class, you have constantly used boxing and unboxing to convert from optional to underlying types. Secondly, if you look at the setter, you will see that uh, setter now accepts optional, but nobody prevents us to pass a null here leading to new, new null pointer exception. And uh, don't forget, uh, main uh, purpose of op optional is to use it as a return type, because when we receive 
something from external API, we don't know, can object be null or not? That's why I use optional. In your class, user class, all of your fields are internal state, internal functionality. You control how, to, how you initialize it, how you assign it. So you know if it's null or not. And it uh, doesn't make sense to use optional as a type for the fields. Uh, the same example about uh, user API. Let's say you create an API that returns a list of users. And return type of the method is optional of list of optional of users. But what is the reason to use a list of optional? Yes. Will anyone use list of nulls? Yes, so it also doesn't make sense. So, so <coughs> both examples are bad practice in Java 8. OK. Another example. You have a method that just sums up all the values in the array. Yeah, to use for each loop. And this developer wants to migrate to Streams API and try to produce this implementation. But it doesn't compile. Why is that? Because in Lambda expression, you're not allowed to modify reference to local variable. So what our developer can do? He can do this implementation, this fantastic code. Uh, it works, but uh, anyone who uh, tried to review it, uh, first of all, it looks weird to him that we use atomic variables inside uh, function, like a local variables. And what is worse, we use uh, the bad practice, we modify external state outside of your functional pipeline. Yeah, so we break out the principles of functional programming. And the correct implementation will be as follows. Because array stream returns in stream, yes, and in stream has some uh, method that just sums up all the elements in the stream. Another example. Let's say you want to create a method that returns uh, first 50 even numbers. You try to use in stream, yes. And uh, that's your draft implementation, but it doesn't have collect. Yeah, so in stream or double stream or long stream doesn't have collect. Because you need collect to convert your stream to a list. So what our developer can do, he can try to convert to array, then array to list, and so on, a lot of transformation that even doesn't compile. But again, if you use, use stream as API, stick to stream API. Don't invoke this transformation. Yeah. And correct option will be to use box function, because box function converts our primitive stream, like in stream, to the ordinary stream. Yes, and ordinary stream has collect uh, method. OK. So that's what one of the implementation, uh, the function that returns uh, first 50 even numbers. And our developer uh, thinks about efficiency. Yeah? Is this code efficient enough? And what he heard is that Java 8 now had parallel streams, and it's very easy to use it. Just uh, call parallel a parallel stream, and now all the functions that goes after that using parallel streams and will be, used, uh, will be called concurrently. And he is happy because uh, his code is now very efficient. Yeah, it's very good. But uh, what uh, does he miss? First of all, uh, you can't control the uh, parallelism level at runtime. Yes, the parallelism level, the number of concurrent friends, threads are defined on the JVM startup. Secondly, all your code will be run concurrently, but it will be run in a common function pool. So all the streams API parallel operations will be run in the common pool. Secondly, since you use concurrency, now we have synchronization, thread contention, and you should wait for the available threads. So does it make sense to use it for a stream of 10 elements or 50 elements? I don't think so. My advice is if you want to use parallelism or concurrency, always try to 
produce benchmarks and measure difference between original option, original implementation, and parallel one. Because it's not clear from the code review which one is better. But there is a, a small hint, small tip, that you can create a new object or function pool, specify the uh, parallel level, number of threads, and if you invoke your parallel stream CPI inside of submit function, that by contract, all of your parallel operations run inside this new version pool, not in the common version pool. Okay, next example. Uh, you have a user CPI uh, that manipulates or handles users. And for example, uh, it has a method that returns all the developers it uses old style uh, for each loop, if and so on. And our developer wants to uh, migrate to stream CPI, and he automatically replaces list with stream. Yes, and here it's its implementation. For him, it looks very promising because he keeps data in stream, he returns stream. So anyone who receives the stream can apply additional operations, transformation, filtering, and receive uh, a final result. But what he missed is that stream has a state. It can be open or closed. And once you call terminal operation, stream is closed, and you cannot use it anymore. Secondly, if we have a list, that's original option, you can easily add items to list, remove it, and it's not possible for stream, because stream, again, is not a structure. We can combine streams here, yeah, but another question. So using stream as a field is not a good idea. Uh, what about returning stream? Uh, in the original version, we return a list, now return a stream. Uh, it might be a good idea, but if you receive a stream from some uh, public API, uh, don't share it again amongst some threads or some functions. Become, because once this function closes stream, no one else can use it. So inside you like private API, it's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the options how can implement uh, stream CPI with our user manager. Another example, we have a user class which has a list of roles, and this uh, list of roles defines user behavior and user rights. And you want to create a method that returns a list of all users with specified role. So how can you do? You can create stream of users, uh, invoke filter function, and inside filter function, you create another stream and in this second stream, you call any match function and just check the current role and the requested role. Yes, it works at first sight, but don't forget to create a stream inside of stream. Yeah, so it's possible question about performance and some negative impact. So if you are migrating from uh, like Java 7 to Java 8, yes, you have streams API, but don't forget that you still have a collection API. Yes. And the same operation can be easily done using the user get roles contains role. It can be done because string class uh, has a written equals and hash code. Yeah, so, and the contains will work. Yeah, it will not work if it doesn't have equals and hash code. So we have a more uh, specific implementation. Yes, but this code is uh, more simple and more readable than this one. Another example, yes. You want to create a function that returns all the users to increase their salaries, yes. We have some for each iteration loop, some business logic inside it, and you want to convert it to stream CPI. So what can our developer do? He can create this implementation and first side to use stream CPI because he used stream function, filter function, and collect function. But when someone starts reviewing this code and reach filter function, yes, 
So after that, there's a big bunch of code that's not uh, clear from the first point of view, and person will start wasting their time on that. So what can we, how can we improve it? We can extract this bunch of code into separate function for the further refactoring, yes. And now our code is very simple, very readable, because we have a stream and just calls to filter functions. First function just check if user is developer, and second function just check if user has enough experience. And then we collect to the list. So what is my advice? First of all, if you're using Java 8, uh, try to stick to functional approach, functional programming paradigms, and try to use immutable data, because immutable data are much safer, especially in multi-threading operations, and much easier to test. Secondly, uh, don't use optional or stream as data structures. Use it for the return type or for the uh, intermediate operations. What, uh, secondly, if you want to uh, make a refactoring using new Java 8 API, uh, try to uh, understand you know, what is the benefit of that. Does it make your code more readable, more clear, easier to understand, uh, more flexible or safer? Okay, uh, that's all. And thank you. I hope my talk was useful for all of us. Thank you.